each layer is a file system diff that's identified by a unique hash. You can think of this like a git commit. And the net image is the sum of all the diffs. You can think of this like a git branch. So the git branch has a nice user-friendly name, consists of a lot of commits. Same with the, the docker image, has a nice name, consists of a lot of layers. So more specifically, when you push and pull, you push and pulling layers. And then the image is just the sum of the layers. Um, and this is a small nuance. If one layer changes, all the layers of it are changed as well. And this will be important uh, later on. And as I said, a container is the sum of its images layers plus a kind of, and you can think of it this way, a pseudo layer that contains any changes made at runtime. So it's all of the images layers plus runtime changes. Okay, so as an example, if I run on my computer, I've got a, a, a clean PC, I run Docker images, got Docker install, run Docker images, and there's nothing. I say Docker pool Postgres, and there you can see it's actually pulling all those images, and that's the, the hash for each images that it's pulling. And it says pool complete, download it, the newest image. If I say Docker images again, it lists my newly pulled image there. So you can see there, that's the the repo name, that's the tag which is quite important for this talk. Image ID created just now and it's, it's size. Of it. And then just after that I can say rocket, uh, docker run. And what I do is I publish the internal port of the docker where Postgres is running, 5432. Publish it onto the host at 5555. And I say the docker that I want to run, the image that I want to run as a container now is Postgres, the one I just pulled. And then, right after that, I can connect it. I put the Postgres shell. So all of this, depending on your internet speed, you can do it in less than a minute. So that's really the power of Docker. You don't need, if you were to install Docker, uh, if you were to install Postgres and all of its dependencies from scratch, that would take you a considerable amount of time. And then you would have to initialize the database and all that. This, less than a minute, you have to run. OK, let's look at how you can, as we speak now, can do Really a, a simple, most basic kind of deployment with Docker. We're using Docker Hub, the, the public registry. So let's say you as a developer, you've got your, your application source code on your computer. And you decide you're going to build that application on your computer. You're also going to build the image locally on your computer. And then you're going to push that to Docker Hub. And then from there, you're going to pull it onto your service. Let's, let's look at how that how that will work. So you've got your developer over there, you prepare your code base, whatever that entails, git pull or get it from SVN or, or wherever, get the newest code, you build it, you build your docker image as well, and then you push to docker hub, like that, you say docker push, easy as that, push it up to docker hub, that's after you've created an account of course, and then you pull that image on your service. So you've got your service over here, you say docker pull, like we the Postgres image, you can just pull whatever our image is called. And then you can start the containers on your server. Uh, as easy as that really. So let's look at how we can automate some of these steps. This is a lot of manual work. It's still cool, but manual. So let's automate that. So let's say you as developer, they are on your, on your laptop. <coughs> and you make a change to the code base. So you push directly on master. No? <laughs> when you boot, you, you merge a pull request. And then you've got GitHub set up to notify Docker using a webhook whenever the, the target branch changes. So if you want to build from master, whenever master changes, GitHub says to Docker, we've got a change. Docker says, cool, give me the newest code for that branch. Downloads the code from GitHub and it builds the image. So Docker Hub actually does the building for you. Once it's done, you don't have to push it because it's already there. You just pull it onto your service. So you pull, uh, talk, talk about it. This last step you can also automate if you want. Because Docker Hub also supports a, a webhook like uh, you see there. Like it up. So once it's finished building, it will notify something that you can set up. And then 
for example, something on your service, and then once you get the notification, you can pull the news code. So you can set that up to be automated as well, which means that once you push the code to GitHub, everything after that is automated. You just wait however long it takes, and the image appears on Docker, notifies your service, they pull the image at your set. So that's really the only manual change over here that you saw that still needs uh, user interaction. Now look at how we do it. So the automation that I just showed you, that's pretty sweet. So why didn't we just go with that? Well, we went with that for some time, <coughs> but we encountered some problems. Most notably, that Docker Hub builds are notoriously slow. If you try to build anything sizable, you've waited a considerable amount of time. In our case, for our application, we can wait anything from 25 minutes up to an hour, and even multiple hours in extreme cases for the image to, to finish building. Another issue is flexibility. If Docker cannot do what you want, it's not going to be done. For example, a problem we encountered is our Docker file um, depended on some commands that was from a newer Docker version that Docker Hub had run. So we, there was literally no way that we could get around that. And at that time, compared with the fact that the builds took so long, just decided to scratch that. We are going to use our own dedicated development server for building uh, and also for testing, which we'll get to later. Using this, we, we reduce the build time to 5 to 10 minutes, which is significant, depending on the hardware, of course. Um, but we, we don't have a, a monster of a machine really doing the building just there. Yeah. Is he on? Yeah. And you have unlimited flexibility because if anything needs changing, you can just change it, upgrade your version, install other stuff, whatever. So for now, in that last stage of the other pudding, we still prefer to manually pull it. We still do it that way. It just gives us that uh, extra level of, as as Yaku just said. Um, the extra level of manual intervention. You don't want everything just being done. You want which mostly is, is nothing, and run everything we need to build the app. Then rebase onto the base image, copy from the development image the build code into the base image, CD into it, and set up your, doc, your, your image entry point. The result is that using building from scratch uh, versus optimized building. If we build from scratch, we would have to pull the entire image. Now we just pull updates. If we build from scratch, we would have to set up the entire build environment every time. Now we only set up the changes. Most of the time, this is nothing. Then we build the code. If we build from scratch, we would have to build the entire Docker image as we did in the development image. So we would probably have to ship that whole development image every time. Whereas now we rebase onto the, the minimal base image. Um, so that the production is only the base plus the build code. Building from scratch, we would have to push everything to Docker Hub because the first layer likely introduces a change. Now, we only push the last layer because the base remains unchanged. So, for small apps, the potential speed up might not justify all this extra effort and complexity for small apps. But in our case, for larger apps, Every optimization, even small, at each step, 
adds up, uh, which results in significant overall speed up from, as I said, 25 minutes to an hour, typically, typically to 5 to 10 minutes. And if clients are shouting, <coughs> that, that's important. That's really important. So hopefully this gives you some ideas on how to speed up your, your build and your deployment process. Um, I think that, yeah, that concludes the, the building part. Next, we're going to look at how we use uh, Docker for testing. So first off, important key points to note about how we test. I've mentioned some of this already. Almost all of our tests are functional tests, and we use Selenium for this. Our, our app is web-based, I should say that. The reasoning behind using functional tests is that if you can click a lot of stuff in the browser and you see the right stuff, then a lot of stuff is probably working. So we're not testing too specifically. We test overall, and if we see the correct result, a lot of stuff's working. Because it takes time to write small tests. And yeah, we don't have that much time. <laughs> Remember, and, and this is important, the purpose of automated testing is not to ensure that your, that your code works. Once you submit that code, you know that it works. Well, hopefully you do. The purpose of automated testing is to ensure that your code does not break. That's the purpose. And it's an, an important distinction. That's why functional tests work for us. Because we fix something here, we add a feature here, and we break something there. But we, we've got a, a, a test that, that tests that and a lot of other stuff. So it fails, but at least we know we broke something. Go check it out again. Next point, our tests run in isolation. So for each test that we run, we create a, a new backend and a new uh, DB every time. The reason for this is otherwise test A could do something that, test B, that breaks test B. And then your test B never has a chance of passing if, if you do stuff in the same DB. Um, you can see that the DB we use for testing is, is sizable. Um, so how do you realize 1.2? gigs for every test efficiently. I'll show you how to do that. I think you might like the solution if you don't know it already. Next point, all our tests, well not all of them, but they run in parallel according to the, the capability of the server that we have. I think we run four, four threads <coughs> currently. Uh, we try to get the CPU usage up to 100% of course. Um, the reason we can do this in parallel is because we've got sufficient isolation. This also allows better utilization of resources. And then finally, all our tests run inside of a container, because otherwise, what would be the point of me standing here? So we use Docker for that. How we used to do it, but quickly ran into problems. So this is the first attempt that we started off with, um, somewhat naively, but that's how you learn. We had all our spec files, which just defines the test. Click this, click this, check this, click that, whatever. Um, in JavaScript, that's what we use for, for testing. So our testing framework is WebDriver IO plus Mocha, um, which is not really important for this talk. I'm just listing it. WebDriver IO talks to Selenium. Selenium talks to Chrome. So all of this emulates your user. That's what the user would normally do. You just now define it in code over there. Your browser connects over the interwebs to your Python backend, and then <laughs> behind your Python backend, you've got your database, obviously. So the problem with this, anyone who's done this will know what the problems are. Firstly, oh, well, before I get there, all of this was inside of a single container, the dev container, uh, initially. So the first problem is 1.2 gigs over here for every uh, test run. Now, I'm not even talking about for every single test, just for the process as a whole. As a whole, 1.2 gigs here takes long to set up. So that's the first problem. Second problem, there's no isolation between tests. If you run this test and it drops a DB, for whatever reason, then the, none of the other tests are ever going to work. So th this test should not do that, but it, you can change settings in your app and then stuff's not as the next test expects it to be and stuff breaks. So you need to isolate your tests. And if the tests can't even run off to each other, they have absolutely no chance of passing when running next to each other. So we also didn't have uh, parallel testing at this point. So the first problem, 
how do we reduce the DB setup time? We run the database in a container along with the data. Hold that thought. We only set up the DB once, and then we commit that thing as an image, as its own separate image. So we have an image that's already initialized, all of the 1.2 gigs already initialized. So as I showed you with the example uh, previously, you can then start a container from that image almost instantly. So you get 1.2 gig clean DB almost instantly. In fact, you can start up multiple 1.2 gig DBs, uh, clean DBs simultaneously, instantly, almost. And then cleaning them is as simple as killing and removing the container. Now you might say, what about your data? Well, I say, I don't care. Because your data only needs to persist for the duration of the test. After that, you don't care. But only for testing. Only for testing. Don't put your data inside the container in other cases. So back to that, back to that slide, how we used to do it. So the first thing we did was to uh, extract the database from the development container. So only that stuff's running in the container now. And then we put the DB in its own little container. You know, this is, that is cute. Um, the, the DB image. And that eliminates the long DB setup time because you can simply say docker run. And there you go, 1.2 gig clean DB instantly. The next problem, how do you isolate the tests? Well, for each test, we want to start a new browser, so we get rid of any previous browser state, a new backend and a new DB for each test. So before, the, the process looked something akin to this. We had the tests running on this side. You had your backend and the DB on this side, so the backend started on, let's say, uh, localhost port 8000. Yeah, you start your DB, localhost 8000. You configure your test to run to, to point to localhost uh, port 8000, and then you start your test. That was how we did it initially. And now how we do it is you have your tests over there. And then we have this thing, which is a, a, I'm not actually sure how large this is. I think maybe 200 lines of code, so not that big. The isolator, which we start in port 8000. And what this thing does, this, this is the whole magic of solving this problem. So you start your isolator on port 8000, not your DB, your isolator. And then before a test starts, you do a GET request to localhost port 8000 slash start. The isolator gets that request, says, oh, okay, I see you want to start a new test. You have to, you, you're about to start a new test. Let me quickly spin up a new backend and DB for you. Um, the backend starts up quite fast in our case, about one second to start up. DB starts up almost instantly. And then the isolator replies with a redirect to the port that it started the backend on. So it redirects the test framework to port 8001. And the test configures itself to point to 8001, and then it starts. And then for each new test that you start, the same thing repeats. And it starts a new backend with a new DB on new available ports. So you've got all your tests nicely isolated like that. So back to this slide. What we did here was we inserted the isolator right here. So Chrome connects to the, well, actually the, the testing framework does that, that starting hook to the isolator, it then configures itself to point to the port that was replied with, and then Chrome connects to the backend through on that port. And that solves the problem of no isolation between tests. The next step uh, is, is actually, once you've got this in place, the next step is quite easy because uh, WebDriver IO and Selenium already support multiple um, browser instances. So it's, it's like two lines of configuration that you change. So this becomes this quite easily. So for each test file over here gets its own Chrome instance, its own backend, its own DB. And this then is how we do it now. 
So, final comments. I don't know if you noticed that the isolator is also running inside the container, and it's starting up Python backends and a DB Docker, or a DB container. But it's in a container, and it's starting a container. So how do we do this? You might think, well, you just run Docker inside Docker. Mm -mm. I don't know if this is easier now, but when we did this, that was not easy. And I just abandoned ship, abandoned Docker, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's actually a much easier way. Be careful with this for security, but if, if you write the test code and you are responsible for the code, then you can get away with this. You can actually just mount that file, which is on the host operating system, you can mount inside the container so that a Docker client inside the container can speak to that file, which speaks to the Docker daemon on the host operating system. So you can start and stop dockers, uh, you can start and stop containers from within a container, not as children, but as siblings. Okay, but be careful with that for, for security. Because if, if your container gets compromised, then something else can do that. Then, yeah, that's not good. Um, then you, you might say, well, doesn't it take a while to start a new DB and a new backend <coughs> on demand? Well, yes, it does. But what we do, what the isolate does is, oh, well, well when, when a new test is started, the test can start executing immediately. It doesn't have to wait for the DB and for the backend. And this is because, where's that line? I put that line in. This is because what we do, I, I, I think I might not have just saved that there should be another line there. What we do is the isolate actually pre-allocates um, a backend and a DB um, ahead of time. So it, you might have four tests running simultaneously, and it's, it knows, okay, I've got four backends that's being used currently. I'm going to allocate three more, so long. And then once the fifth test starts, it just gives you one of the backends that's already up. So your test can start instantly. Now, many people, you might say that, well, starting a new DB every time is... Uh, elaborate, it's overcomplicated. Why don't you just use transactions? Well, it's a fair point if you do unit tests, for example. So many people isolate their tests using begin, and then when it's done, they just roll back. But this stops working once things become complicated. So if you've got another process that needs to change something in your DB, so that you can get notified of it and then reply back to your backend. That process has to commit before you get it. And so transactions stop working. You have to do it another way. So the final setup is quite elaborate. And there's a lot of uh, interconnecting pieces. But it works. And it works well. And I think our, our process has been running unmodified for um, about a year now or so. It work, works well. So hopefully you've also learned something useful um, about how to use Docker for automated testing. And that's it. I actually missed my timer guy. I've got one minute. Um, questions? Yeah, let him give you the mic and then you ask a question. If you've got a question. Okay, so to comment, um, you said there are no um, guest operating systems in Dockers. Yeah. But I think there are. The guest operating system is there, but no biggie. I don't want to start an you're argument. You're correct, yeah, you're correct. Um, <coughs> but it's a lot smaller. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's really light. Yeah, yeah. You, well, you can ma make it very lightweight. Yeah. Um, I've never tried this, but let's say you've got a container running on, ba based on image 1.0 and you change image, that image to 1.1, can you then upgrade the, the container to the newer version of the image while kind of on the fly? I cannot answer definitively, but I would not think so. You would have to stop and start. That's what we do. I can't imagine how you can just, because one, the new version might be something completely different. It might be, I mean, yeah, it might be something completely different. It, 
the appropriate solution would rather be to do a load balancing of sorts and then upgrade one of the five, and that we do with our transaction switch, which runs high volumes, and we have 10 APIs sitting there, uh, Nginx load balancing onto them, and we upgrade them one by one by one. Give it a second. If everything works, we roll over the rest. Um, Was this useful to anyone? Because, okay, I'm glad. I'm glad. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you. Oh, one more question. In the second scenario where you uh, skip uh, building on Docker Hub, uh, yeah. why does it actually have to go to Docker Hub at all then? To be pulled from your server, just for signing purposes? Or? Well, I guess you can just pull it from your server okay. if you want to. We, we push it to, to Docker Hub. Because it's just, every, if, if you get a clean install of Docker on your computer and you say git pull, or, or Docker pull, it knows where Docker Hub is, uh -huh. so to speak. So we just, I, I guess you can configure it to pull from your own server if you so desire. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you.